continuing our trial analysis of the double murder trial for Alec Murdoch. We're checking in with our Greg Adeline today as we continue our team coverage. Greg has been live in Colleton County listening in on this trial since day one. Obviously, Greg, a lot to get to today as we are hearing from the surviving son of the Murdoch family, mm -hmm. Buster, today, Judy. So, Greg, that ha you could, I, I imagine, I'll put it that way, you could hear a pin drop in that courtroom when Buster took the stand. Oh, there's no doubt about that, Judy and Billy Jean, certainly because in this case is a highly anticipated witness, Buster Murdoch, somebody who we haven't heard from since June the 7th, 2021. He's been relatively quiet today, breaking his silence, a defense witness getting up, talking about some of the family dynamics there and talking about some of the I guess elements of Alec Murdoch's character. He's a character witness on behalf of the defense. And really, it's kind of a double edged sword here. You know, what was going to happen with the defense bringing him forward? Mostly, he was there to kind of rebut at least some of the evidence that the prosecution has put forward in the weeks prior here. And so, as he comes up, he's talking about different takes or at least giving a different angle on some of the things that we heard from some of these witnesses here. But when when it came to the cross-examination, Judy, Billy Jean, the question here was how hard were prosecutors going to go after Buster Murdoch in a situation like this? Were they going to press him? Were they going to call him on certain facts surrounding this case? Because after all, he's somewhat of a victim here. He's lost a brother. He's lost a mother. And so the question was, what were they going to press him on? Well, it turns out they did not press him on very much at all. And we'll get to that. Billy Jean, Judy, I don't know if you kind of caught the same thing, but it seemed as though the cross-examination was not nearly as tough as it could have been. Yeah, that's right, Greg. And noticeably missing from the cross-examination, uh, prosecutors did not show that dog kennel video, obviously, which was taken in, uh, from Paul's phone just moments before both Pat, Maggie and Paul were found murdered. Why do you think the prosecution did not show that video where we've seen other witnesses confirm that it was indeed Alec Murdoch's voice that they heard on that video, uh, even though he was not seen on camera? Well, Billie Jean, really the way you got to look at it is it could have been risky for the prosecution to bring that up because after all, Buster Murdoch could just deny it out of hand that that was his father's voice at those kennels. He could say, nope, it wasn't him. And in fact, there was another video earlier on. It was the Snapchat video from 756 in which Buster Murdoch said, that isn't the shirt that prosecutors say he was wearing. It was a different shirt. So he had already rebutted evidence there and so this was a situation where they did not want him to go up and say, well, that's not my dad's voice because there's been eight witnesses who have got up there who have said that it in fact was Alec Murdoch's voice. The prosecution likely felt that the evidence is on the books. The jury's already heard it and there was no benefit necessarily to having Buster Murdoch get up and go ahead and rebut any of that in front of that jury. So far, everyone who has heard that video has heard Alec Murdoch on that tape. Buster Murdoch would have been the first person to say it wasn't him and prosecutors didn't even want to touch that. Greg, you talked about that cross-examination kind of with kit gloves, so to speak, for Buster Murdoch. Not the case, though, for the forensics engineer who proved to be, I think, a solid witness for the defense, but he faced a much stronger cross-examination. Let's take a listen to some of the questions about his credentials, and then we'll talk about it on the other side. Have you had any formal training in firearms or firearms, um, how, they, how they work? No. Are you a member of any organizations um, that, that do that line of work, that, that do tests on firearms or, or pathology? No. Have you taken any shooting <clears throat> incident reconstruction classes? No. Do you have any certifications in shooting incident and reconstruction? No. Do you have any, have you taken any classes in gunshot wounds? No. Have you ever done any studies on bullet trajectory from uh, out of the muzzle of a gun? Yes. Okay. So, Greg, they got him to say on the stand, I think more than once, that he's not a pathologist. He's not a gun uh, expert of any kind, really trying to raise 
I guess, questions about his credibility with the jury, would you say? Yeah, certainly, especially after he got up and gave some detailed testimony, at least in his expert findings about some of the ballistics in this case, you know, bringing up the possibility that these uh, shooters were had would have had to have been much shorter than Alec Murdoch, saying that if it were Alec Murdoch, then he would have had to shoot at a low angle. Also talking about some of the evidence, at least that he was able to do in some of his testing, that perhaps you couldn't hear gunshots from the home, uh, from the kennels. And he talked about some of that auditory evidence, although on cross-examination, prosecutors also brought up that when he was doing his analysis, of course, uh, the trees had grown in much thicker than what they were back in 2021 on June the 7th. And then he also talked about uh, at least one of the key elements here from the testimony last week when prosecutors had established that Alec Murdoch arrived at Moselle at 10.05 and then made a 911 call almost immediately upon arriving on the scene. And during that 911 call, he said that he checked the pulses of the victims, Paul and Maggie Murdoch, that he lifted Paul, and then he went and called 911, all within the span, as the evidence showed, of 20 seconds. Well, Sutton, this... Uh, analyst who got up today, a forensic analyst, a defense witness, and got up and said, well, you know, you could actually see the victims with the headlights of the vehicles, kind of extending that timeline for Alec Murdoch, poking holes in perhaps what was pretty airtight evidence on Friday. So compelling in some ways, but also, as you just heard, the prosecution coming back on cross-examination, questioning every single one of his credentials, every single one of his qualifications, saying that you're not a pathologist again, and just saying that he wasn't necessarily qualified to testify about what he was talking about. And Greg, uh, what was the most compelling piece of evidence, in your opinion, in today's testimonies from the witnesses? Well, perhaps the most compelling was Buster Murdoch saying that that wasn't his dad's shirt, or at least that the, the shirt that they were alleging that Alec Murdoch was wearing, he was saying, no, that isn't the shirt that prosecutors say it was. It wasn't that Columbia blue shirt. And that, again, this shirt is very important in some ways to the prosecution's case, because again, that shirt has never been found. And at least the inferred reference there is that that could have been the shirt that he was wearing if and when he committed these murders. So the Buster Murdoch rebutting that in, in, in different ways was powerful for the defense, but ultimately that kennel video that wasn't played was equally telling in, in many ways. All right, our Greg Adeline doing an excellent job covering this trial, leading our team coverage there in Colleton County. Uh, Greg, we're looking forward to much more. The defense, I believe, said it intends, it hopes to wrap its case by the end of the week. So we are slowly but surely moving closer to this case being given to the jury. Thank you, Greg, for that excellent insight as always. Yeah, and court will resume at 930 tomorrow morning. And of course, we'll have complete coverage of the Murdoch murder trial.